the cypherpunk culture. And there's kind of a caricature of that culture, which is sort of the, the, the libertarian individual versus society, like the, the lone American frontiersman who doesn't need anyone or whatever. But I identify more with uh, like a sister culture on the, in the family tree, uh, which we call the high-tech Hayekians, um, after Friedrich Hayek. Um, the high-tech Hayekians are like the cypherpunks, all about tech, but they're more about society and, and how to organize society. During the horrors of the 20th century, a lot of Western intellectuals thought that the free and open democratic societies were just disordered. They were just chaotic. They were out of control. And the Soviet model of scientific, rational organization of society from the top down was the only option for making society safe and efficient. Um, and it was Friedrich Hayek in the mid-20th century who taught us otherwise, that, uh, that no, order and safety and prosperity can spring from the ground up, not only from the top down. So the high-tech Hayekians have been around since before Bitcoin, but um, for, for me and for many but not all of the Zcashers, I consider, or some of us consider, nation-state currencies to be our best competitors. Our goal is to offer people, or my goal at least, many of our goal, is to offer people uh, an appealing alternative. Uh, but competitors are not enemies. Competitors are your best friends because competitors are the people who show you how to make yourself better and how to offer more value to people. And I would assume, I, I'm willing to bet, and I look forward to finding out, uh, that most of us here in this room agree on a lot of things. First of all, tech changes everything. Uh, and faster and faster, it looks like. Um, second of all, I think you guys know more than I know about the necessity of privacy in the function of an economy. Um, I've seen lots of things today and, uh, and, and generally in economics about how if you didn't have privacy, a lot of things just couldn't happen, just wouldn't work, right, economically. Um, and most importantly, I, I think that's been going on during my life, I'd say in the last 20 years, what I've seen is that tech has changed everything you know, such that all of our countries and all of our societies have entered a rapid slide into an unprecedented social experiment in which one or three or 10 companies or large organizations have real-time, fine-grained monitoring and control over a hundred million or a billion people. And not only of their actions or not only of their economic actions, because almost everything we do is economic, but also of their thoughts, because uh, we can't think without other people. And today, the way we share with other people, the way we share thoughts with other people is through technology. So, this is a very risky, very fragile world that we have suddenly entered that has never been tried before in human history. And as a society, as science, and as industry, and as society, we are just beginning to grapple with that. We are still asking what happened, and what, if anything, should we do about it? Um, but there's a lot of other ways that technology is changing things. Before Bitcoin, what's that now, 13 years ago or so, um, it wasn't possible for someone to issue a new financial asset that wasn't 
a debt. Well, it wasn't reliant on some central counterparty to make it valuable or to make it good. Um, and now, after Bitcoin and Ethereum, anyone can issue a new asset that's not a debt. It's a new thing. Um, and people are doing so you know, faster and faster. It really changes. It's, it changes my assumptions, at least, about what kinds of money are possible by technology enabling people to do things they could never have done before. But I think it'll keep happening. I've been thinking a lot about payments and the medium of exchange. So the simple model that's probably endured forever is that you have to agree on the currency between the two parties before you can make an exchange, right? If you want to buy a, uh, yet another espresso in the coffee shop, if you, know, if you have yen and they don't want yen, they only want francs, you've got a problem. Uh, but nowadays, when I slide my credit card, they don't know if I started with yen or American dollars or what. They still get francs, right? Uh, but that can get weirder, maybe. Uh, maybe in the not-too-distant future, every individual will have their own preferences. I have fractionalized shares of artwork, and I don't know what you want. It's going to turn out that you want oil futures, uh, but I don't know that, and I don't need to know that. I just uh, take my coffee. Uh, I have fewer fractionalized shares of artwork, and you have more oil futures, and neither of us have to think about it. That could happen, too. Tech can reduce all kinds of friction in weird ways that have never been done before. Maybe. Um, and likewise with uh, uh, long-term contracts, uh, this is a really sticky part of currency throughout all of human history, is if you have a long-term contract and the unit of account changes in value during the course of that contract, that's really going to upend at least half of everyone's uh, lives, right? Their plans. But what if in the near future, my long-term contract and yours that we've both entered into are indexed or hedged in such a way that we're relatively oblivious to what unit of account the counterparty cared about when we started? I don't know. That could happen. So Zcashers, as a movement, at least most of us, are here to fight the global panopticon, uh, which threatens entire populations with disasters comparable to the totalitarian disasters of the 20th century. But as high-tech Hayekians, we're also here to explore what's possible, what's better, what's possibly better for future generations because of innovation. Now, the first innovation that we started with in Zcash was privacy. Uh, and that's not the only one that matters, but that's what became possible in about 2013 or 2012, I think, Satoshi and some of the other early Bitcoiners talked about the privacy problem in Bitcoin. Um, from the beginning, pretty much 100% of everyone involved in Bitcoin, as far as I remember, considered uh, a non-discretionary monetary policy, you know, the 21 million simple rule, and privacy to be the two twin reasons for Bitcoin's existence. And in about 2012 or 2013, Satoshi and others talked about, um, could we add encryption to Bitcoin to solve Bitcoin's privacy problem? And they thought about it a bit, and they said, no, we can't. Zero knowledge proofs would be necessary for that, and zero knowledge proofs aren't good enough yet. And about four months later, Satoshi disappeared from the internet forever. Uh, and about, oh no, that was in 2010 when they had that conversation. Because about four months after that conversation, Satoshi disappeared from the internet forever. And in 2013, the zero knowledge proof technology, thanks in part to Alessandro Chiesa, who gave the talk this morning, uh, became good enough that 
it was possible to add end-to-end -end encryption to an open ledger, a blockchain. So here's some things about privacy that almost everyone misunderstands, and maybe the people in this room understand it better than most. Um, but the main thing that people misunderstand is that privacy isn't about isolation. Privacy isn't about withholding as much information as you can, about being the lone American individualist. Privacy is about consent. What you, who you trust, and what you trust them with is your choice. It's not theirs and it's not anyone else's. That's consent. And that's very compatible with Hayek's notion of bottom-up ordering of society. Um, one really interesting thing that I think, like, as humans, we're still processing the, the, the like seismic shift in society due to information technology taking over the world in the last 20 years. We're also still at the very beginnings of processing blockchain and zero-knowledge proofs. Um, and one thing that I keep thinking about as a blockchain engineer is that you can't... It, if privacy is about data leakage or data sharing and it's about consent over data sharing, then you can't really, it's very, very hard or nigh impossible to add privacy on an upper layer. So if you have a layer of, um, uh, of your service or application or blockchain or whatever, which discloses information about you uh, willy-nilly without your intention, then a new layer that you add on top can't really take that back. Uh, the information has already been disclosed to the people you didn't intend. So that's why Bitcoin and Ethereum as they currently exist are a really bad basis uh, as a starting point to build on top of. Now, if you do it in the other order, that helps you realize that privacy is a lot more flexible than you think. So if you have a base layer in which information is disclosed only to specific parties of your choice um, and only by your consent, it's actually very easy to add additional disclosure on top of that, right? Um, which additional disclosure is necessary for almost everything, right? Um, you can implement a policy of disclosing certain things uh, to certain people and you can add that on top of an encrypted blockchain uh, without having to change the underlying blockchain. Um, but architecturally, it's an awfully big lift to do it the other way around. Oh my goodness, I'm almost done. I hope you have questions or else we're going to go to dinner early. <laughs> Bring me another espresso. Okay. These are just the simple, high-level reasons that we're here, that I'm here. So um, when it was time to say goodbye to Andrea at the train station, he said, once I sold my Bitcoin and bought Ethereum, I didn't care anymore about Bitcoin. And once I sold my Ethereum, I didn't care anymore. I don't care anymore about Ethereum. But I will never stop caring about Zcash. Why? And I was like, <laughs> why? He said, because of them. And he pointed to his two little brown-eyed Chaldean children. He said, I don't want them to grow up in a world without privacy. So I don't know if I'll ever see Andrea again. He may have disappeared back into the Zcash invisible underground, but I know he and those like him are out there as allies. And I hope it will turn out that some of you in this room are allies too. That's totally all I had. I hope you have like 30 minutes of questions.
Thank you very much. That was a, an amazing um, presentation.